if you're using trpc you can sort of as long as you're using um, a monorepo architecture then you can just infer your backend in any of your other apps whether it's a mobile app or an internal admin app or your public website or whatnot Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Today, we are joined by Alex uh, Johansson. Alex is the creator of TRPC. Goes by Cat, K-A-T-T, a lot exactly, online. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, Alex. So great to have you here. Would you like to take a moment to tell our guests a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Alex. I'm a software engineer. I've been making websites since I was uh, a kid and professionally for 15 or so years. I've been bouncing around between front end, back end and, and mobile throughout my career. Worked a bit with everything. I was reading a little bit about your background and I saw that you used to like have a business running Counter-Strike servers. I, I played a lot of Counter-Strike in high school, <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> How'd you get yeah, into yeah. that? Well, um, that, that's sort of like how I got into like serious, like end to end, everything from running a server to like uh, front end web programming. As a teenager, I also played a lot of Counter-Strike servers. And then uh, when I was 13, we had a break in in our house and I lost my gaming computer. Oh, and wow. then most of my friends were sort of online and stuff. So I got more and more into like co coding stuff. Like I was still part of my team, did a website and, and whatever. And then eventually I got approached by a friend of like an internet friend of mine from the same town that had a brother that had a server that he wasn't using in his company. And we had this idea of starting a Counter-Strike website where you could host your own server. So it started as a sort of like a form where you sort of enter your details, you send me some money over the wire, uh, and then it gradually developed to like a a completely automated system where you know you go in you configure your server and you buy it it auto renews every month you can extend it configure the server do everything you want to that's awesome and uh, yeah that's sort of that's sort of the foundation of my web develop what my whole like development skills is that company that i started at 16. Wow, that's super impressive <laughs> All I was coding at 16 was using a WYSIWYG web editors to create <laughs> one-off joke sites. Uh, didn't even think about starting a business. <laughs> I mean, it was I didn't really call it a business, really. I, I made some money on it. Like, as a teenager, it was good money, but, like, it wasn't enough to live on. Right, yeah. I, you know, I... I hear a lot of stories about people who like, you know, it's like I started programming when I was 14 and had this, you know, business doing this thing. I didn't like, I tried to teach myself how to program and it was just Greek to me. And I was like, I don't understand a word of this. It was like, it wasn't until college when I had like my first programming class and I like, it just clicked and it's like, oh, oh, I get this. Yeah. But before then, I don't know. I, 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 it was unfortunate that I didn't have like a comp sci program or something in high school. We just, we had, I did have a lot of electronic classes. I had actual yeah. electronics class and a robotics class, which ironically to tie this all together in our robotics class, what we did most of the time was play Counter-Strike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. I mean, every, everyone's way is different, right? I, I can't learn coding through, you know, getting taught by a teacher. I have to get my hands dirty. I only learn by doing. I, I think the only, I mean, I know the only programming book I have is the JavaScript's The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford. That's the only one I own that's like this big. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that. I don't think I've ever read a programming book. Uh, every new programmer I meet, I'm like, like, the first thing I say is go build something. Like, stop trying to learn yeah. programming, just go build something and yeah. you'll learn way more. Exactly. Yeah. Why, why learn how a for loop works? Just like, yeah, it's pointless. Just like learn by doing it's the only way for me at least cool well maybe let's talk about trpc a little bit could you tell our our listeners what trpc is and what inspired you to create it yeah uh, so trpc is a set of tools for making end-to-end -end type safe apis it sounds very wordy or complex when you say it like that but essentially what it allows you to do is to write your 
back end and the front end in a more like integrated way. You basically write functions on the back end that you can then infer all of the types off on the front end. So you don't have to spend time writing a Swagger schema or GraphQL schema. So it's an alternative to like REST or GraphQL for specifically for internal APIs. And it works for anything that is in TypeScript. So it, it requires you to have TypeScript on both sides to sort of get the awesomeness of the type inference, but you can make like a React app or a React Native app, and it's not actually tied to React itself. So you can use it in other frameworks as well. And when you were creating it, what were the alternatives at the time? Why did you choose to create something new instead of turning to what was already there? So I... I, I was actually a contributor to Blitz before I started working on TRBC. And the problem, like I had some issues with Blitz, but the main thing was that the only magic of Blitz that I really wanted was this sort of like being able to import your code from the back end to front end. That's the so, sort of like the only thing I cared about. And then I stumbled on an early proof of concept of TRPC made by Colin I forgot his last name, but he has also created some other open source library like Zod. And I just got super amazed that this sort of inference is um, possible from the back end to the front end and got completely obsessed with like building it. So I, I took over the project in January and got like the first version in end of January or something like that. And then been just been iterating on it ever since. A big part of my inspiration is like I mentioned earlier, I was born this sort of like PHP lamp stack. And uh, back then you you could write like your uh, SQL or like uh, your database call next to your front end code. Uh, so you just wrote HTML and then you just called your database and you just could use that uh, data straight away. And since moving to Node.js 10 years ago or something, I, I've always missed the sort of productivity I had when I when I could do that. And TRPC sort of like gives you that feeling that it's just like one big interconnected thing of your front end and back end, and you can really move really fast. Yeah, this is actually how I learned about TRPC. So for our listeners, if you're not aware, um, so Blitz.js is an open source project that kind of, it seems like it's kind of trying to make a Rails plus environment for the Node ecosystem, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and one of their one of their sort of seminal features, like Alex mentioned, was this ability to have uh, you you sort of import your server code and use it in your client code, and it just works. So like behind the scenes, it sort of like there's a there's a, a build time system that comes through and like transforms that into an RPC call. And maybe in a second it'll be good for us to talk about like what RPC is conceptually. <laughs> yeah, um, that might be important. But yeah, it's actually. When I, I did the same thing as I was, I was looking through Blitz and I was like, okay, I really love this. I would like to see this. And then stumbled across TRPC. So it's a, it's a cool, cool connection. Yeah. I mean, Blitz, uh, Blitz is powerful, but it's a really uh, wide product and you have to buy into a lot of different things when you choose to go with that stack. And if uh, Brandon decides tomorrow not to, continue the project, you're kind of doomed. TRPC is sort of like, it's one part of the equation, but it's pretty easy to like migrate over from TRPC to GraphQL later. If you want that, you just copy over the resolvers. There's no lock-in in anything else in your stack. So stepping back a little bit, for our listeners who might not know what an RPC is, well, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah, so RPC stands for Remote Procedure Call. So, I mean, in, in its bare in its bare form, I guess, uh, it's just a way of calling functions in another system as if you're part of that system, but you're sitting on the outside. So in the context of TRPC, it's like when you're in your front end, it kind of feels like you're in your back end, even though you're not, and you can sort of use the backend function as if you're in that system, but you're actually just shipping an API call to the backend when you're uh, calling functions. This might not be the best explanation of RPC. Maybe you can fill in some gaps in my explanation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's good. I mean, RPC is is a 
conceptually like probably the old one of the oldest if not the oldest like mechanism of implementing apis it was like this this idea that you have something that you want to call somewhere else so so rpc sort of evolved as like that mechanism and this was like to my knowledge predated things like rest apis and, and and things like that before those were sort of really formalized we had rpc calls there's a lot of systems that still use like xml rpc which is like rpc yeah. over like this xml protocol which is kind of gnarly but you know it's a cool sort of technology the, but people often choose not to use that. I mean, we've had all these other API mechanisms that have evolved mm. over the years. Um, so maybe let's talk about like comparing and contrasting specifically in this case, TRPC with like some other technology. So, so TRPC gives you the ability it, or it's like, it's strongly typed on both sides because you're using TypeScript mm. on both sides. So it's like you, you get this sort of like close type inference between both your server and your client code. But theoretically, you could also get something like that via tooling around GraphQL. Why would you choose something like TRPC over GraphQL? Or what are the trade-offs between the two? Yeah. So, I mean, GraphQL is amazing. And I've, I've been a massive advocate and user for of GraphQL for five years. So I have a lot of love for uh, GraphQL. One thing uh, with what you just mentioned, you you can achieve all of those things with GraphQL. However, the tooling is kind of hairy. It's kind of a lot to learn. You have these code generations running to you know, sort of create this type safe file on your front end. You have to redeclare your schema several times because you have a database schema, you have a GraphQL schema, then you have resolvers, and then you have your front end that is using stuff. The, the main thing with, with the difference between GraphQL and TRPC, or not actually the main thing, but one of the things is that it's a lot more work to work with the GraphQL API. It takes a lot longer to get up and running. The iteration cycle or cycles are uh, longer. However, once you have a GraphQL API, you can also like publicly expose that. TRPC is not trying to be a solution for sort of public APIs. Because by the nature, the only sort of guarantee of the schema's shape and whatever is uh, in its type, which is just transient at build time. So there's no concept of API versioning because it's just like, uh, this is the data that function returns. And if you then deploy another function of that, and if it's a public API, you'll get these like sudden breaks and whatever. The main thing is like, it's a lot faster to work with TRPC than GraphQL, you can move a lot faster. With GraphQL, you get a lot of more safety in terms of, you know, you have field-based resolvers and stuff like that. You can do really granular authentication and authorization on a sort of like per field level and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but yeah, it's also like scaling GraphQL is really hard too, because uh, it's all post requests that are all looking in a unique way. With TRPC, all the queries happen so we get. So you can just put an HTTP cache in front of your backend and happy days. So uh, with a lot of these API strategies, it's like oftentimes I think when you're trying to decide what, what should I use for a product, it's, it's important to understand how, like how the API is optimally consumed. So for example, you, you said the a constraint of TRPC is like, this is for a private API. You're communicating directly between some sort of backend system and, and your front end product. Is it sort of like a one-to-one -one if you're like building a backend for a front end? Is that the sort of ideal use case? Or is it like internal product interfaces where it's like you could have a mobile app and a web app both communicating to a sort of private backend system? Yeah, so you could have like five front ends and one backend or bespoke sort of services for the backend architecture as well. And you can glue them together as sort of like one front end experience. That's a big differentiator from Blitz as well. If you're doing a Blitz API, you can only use it within uh, that project. If you're using TRPC, you can sort of, as long as you're using um, a monorepo architecture, then you can just infer your backend in any of your other apps whether it's a mobile app or an internal admin app or your public website or whatnot. Gotcha, gotcha. 
Yeah, so it seems like so TRPC sits firmly in that sort of like private domain. It's like this is an internal yeah. API. GraphQL sort of straddles that line. I actually, um, I'm I'm not a proponent of public GraphQL APIs because I think the the sort of complexity of managing like DDoS attacks from like query complexity or like handling authorization like there's a bunch there's a whole slew of problems caching yeah. all these things that yeah. make that actually really hard and then uh, rest endpoint which is just you know HTTP it's like pretty easy to make that a public thing so it's 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 always interesting to know where it falls on the spectrum yeah I mean GraphQL has a lot of those issues no not it's not issues it, there's a lot of challenges that you have to become really good at if you choose to adopt GraphQL. I've written some query complexity analysis on GraphQL backends and stuff, and you're sort of guessing your way until you get a good benchmark. It's just, there's a lot of hard problems you sort of inherit when you choose GraphQL. That's, that's not to say that it's bad. I think it's great. But yeah, especially when you're doing a public service, it gets uh, really hard to deal with those problems when you have to think about all the attack vectors and stuff. Yeah, it seems like writing your API with TRPC seems a lot more natural than going into something like GraphQL where you have to learn this whole new language just to, to write queries. Yeah. Another second order effect of that is if you're writing stuff like GraphQL, like my first GraphQL project, I thought I would just have types, but you don't just have types. You have to use all these tools to generate the types for you. So... Like, yeah. do you see a lot of benefits of the way TRPC does that? And you kind of like skip the code gen process? Yeah, I I think, I mean, that's a really, really nice feature with TRPC. You just have to you know, install one package and then you just have all of that tooling automatically because it's part of the project. I've set up GraphQL tooling for type safety on, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 different projects, but it's hard every time. And I'm not a junior developer, so I can't, I think like most people dealing with GraphQL sort of miss the whole type safety aspect of it because they end up just writing a JavaScript front end anyway and not really using the great type safety that is in GraphQL because it's too complex to fix all of that or like to hook it up. Um, so yeah, that's the, a really good aspect of the TRPC is sort of like you don't have to think about types, uh, type safety or TypeScript that much. It's just there. And if you just like write a function without any sort of TypeScript in it and return it, it it will work as if it is JavaScript. And the sort of compiler will just tell you when you do things wrong. So it makes it almost as easy as writing normal JavaScript, but, or, but just with more like more help. Yeah, that's, that's what a good TypeScript API should feel like. You shouldn't have to feel like, oh, I'm wrestling with TypeScript. TypeScript's the magic. TypeScript is, is what makes it feel better. Like uh, the infer type I think you have in there, that's like that's awesome. You just you write an endpoint, you infer it, types are there, you're done. It's That's a great, great bit of DX you got there. Yeah, inferring types is so much nicer to work with than declaring types. Uh, 100% agree on that. So you have, as TypeScript does, lots of enforcing of types at build time. Does TRPC provide a way to enforce those types at runtime? Since now you can like kind of like, you know, the types a lot more than if it were just types since you're using stuff like Zod and these other JavaScript TypeScript checking libraries. So does it do any runtime checking? No, uh, it doesn't. Or, or, well, it does on input arguments. So anything you send from the client to the server has to go through uh, a validator. And that validator can be Zod or Yap or Joy, or there's a bunch of different uh, ones I have support. But that's one of the things I sort of like decided uh, in the architecture to enforce that you can't just say that the input is of this shape. You have to say, this is a validator. And then I inferred the types uh, that that validator spits out on the other end. However, on the outputs, I don't do any validation. You're sort of like, I trust that the server sends me what it inferred, and I don't do any further type checking than that on the runtime. 
That's cool. I, I really like how you designed it where you can bring your own validation library and you didn't like create your own bespoke one. Yeah, I mean, there's so many good ones already. Like, and I know how much work it's been for Colin, uh, who who wrote Sod, um, to just maintain that. Like, it's not, it's not a trivial problem no. to write a good validation library. Yeah, I, I used IOTS to validate uh, auto plugin types, and it's it's crazy what that stuff can do. <laughs> I've never gotten into IOTS. Uh, maybe you can talk a bit about IOTS. Um, well, they all seem to have a pretty similar API. Uh, what I like about IOTS is that it's pretty close to what you do in TypeScript. So if you want a partial, you use uh, ts.partial or whatever it is. And uh, it ends up being pretty easy. The validation part is like, I wanted to have like rich error messages for bad pl plugin types. And I did have to write some custom validation logic for that, but it... It did work out in the end. It did take a little while to get my head wrapped around, like all the IOTS and FPTS. They have yeah. very, like, I don't know, obtuse APIs. Like they're just kind of hard to wrap your head around if you haven't encountered that type of API before. But once you start to understand it, it gets it gets a lot easier. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm touching on the edge of uh, functional programming <laughs> and a lot of things I do nowadays. Uh, but I haven't done the leap fully yet. Yeah, it's quite a big leap. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's quite rewarding, though, I think. Yeah, it feels pure, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it should. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> you're doing it well. I did have a question. It's a little bit of a change of subject, but a question about like transport layers. You mentioned earlier that the difference between TRPC and GraphQL is that with TRPC, you're doing a Git request as opposed to a post request, meaning you, you can take some advantages of, of caching. But in the case of GraphQL, nothing about GraphQL actually specifies that it must be done over HTTP. Uh, it's just like that's the common implementation. So just looking at TRPC docs, it looks like you're sort of like thinking about like transport layer a little bit under the hood. It's like, what might it look like if it was not uh, HTTP? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've actually gone uh, a step further down, if you will. And uh, the lower level RPC layer is like, is following JSON RPC. And I've outlined a sort of spec on how, how that works. And then I actually support two transport layers. I both support HTTP and WebSockets. So you can actually do real-time stuff with TRPC as well, and there's subscription support, and it looks sort of similar to how GraphQL does it. But yeah, the transport layer is not strictly HTTP. There is a lower-level sort of spec on it. And you can call it just like within the server as well. You don't have to go through the, the HTTP layer. Nice, nice. And that uses a concept. It looks like that uses a concept called links. It reminds me a little bit of Apollo's links. Do you want to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Links is a, is a way to customize how the data flow works from your client to your server. So for instance, if you have subscription support, you have a real-time app, you might want to have some of the real-time stuff always happening over WebSockets because it changes often you want to have like a push mechanism on that. But then you might have some requests that you want heavily cached or whatever. Then you can uh, customize that data flow with a link and say that if it's of type query, it should go over HTTP. And if it's of like mutation and uh, subscription, it should go over WebSockets. Uh, so it's very heavily inspired from uh, Apollo's uh, links concept. It's just like a way of saying like, okay, when, when the data flows goes to the server, it should steer off in this way um, or that way, depending on your logic. And you can add stuff like loggers and other stuff in there too. Super cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the things we find interesting in T TRPC, but what are your favorite bits of DX that we might ha not have discussed here? Uh, one that I saw while looking through the docs is the request batching seems pretty cool. Like you can either batch them yourself or just like do a bunch of requests and it looks like it kind of auto batches. Uh, could you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. 
So I was super excited about that when I first released it. And now I just enabled it by default and sort of forgotten about it because <laughs> it just happens now. But essentially, if you have two queries that happens at the same time, they will actually be put into the same HTTP request to the server. And then the client has to do less work uh, over the network. And the server also has to do less work because it only gets one HTTP request. And you can create like the context object about that request once per request and then it sends them all back as one big JSON body. The main thing I'm um, excited about is I, I need to get this out to more React Native developers because I have not seen anything similar in terms of React Native and the fact that we have like over the air updates and stuff nowadays makes it so fast to be able to write like your back end and your front end at the same time and just deploy it to 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 users straight away with over there updates you don't really have to think about api versioning as strictly as before and i think when people start realizing the sort of speed they can work with if they use react native and something like trpc not necessarily trpc there'll be a bit of a shift in that development too because who hasn't spent like countless hours on either complaining about Swagger schemas or writing as Swagger schemas? It's just like, it's painful. And no one follows them because they're not actually enforced by the spec. And this GraphQL is enforced in itself and self-documenting. But it's just wasted time. Does TRPC, you just mentioned self-documenting for GraphQL, does TRPC have a self-documenting feature? Can I generate a documentation website for my API or is that out of scope? Not right now. You can do it, you can generate it based on the input types, but you don't have any information about the output types automatically. I've been planning on doing features like that. I'm also planning about doing like an automated swagger schema and stuff based on TRPC because it would be definitely possible. I just haven't spent that much time on it. I think the the way I like to write software myself is to have descriptive variable names over having too much documentation. So the way I would advise people when using TRPC would be to have like have bespoke input variable names that sort of self explain what they do. But yeah, you can't actually document it unless you do some some sort of custom logic on that. Does JS doc work? Oh yeah, that you can actually do. If you have an output and you have, if you have a JS docked object that you are returning your TRPC backend, that will actually be inferred straight away to the client as well. Awesome. So that, that works. I find JS doc to be some of the best documentation because it's like, it's just so, so immediate, the feedback loop, you hover, you click the arrow and you're like, oh, that's what it does. It's, yeah. it's definitely my favorite way to read documentation nowadays. Yeah, you can do that on the output. On the on the input, you can't do that because it goes through a validator. In TypeScript, you can't infer documentation in uh, in generics, unfortunately. If you merge two types, you lose the documentation. Mm, yeah, that's unfortunate. So you talked a little bit earlier about React Native and, and wanting to share TRPC more with React Native developers. You have this project template called Zart, Z-A-R-T, yeah. um, which is a sort of a React Native stack with TRPC. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's just a, a starter project for sort of a React Native. It's like a monolithic project where you have if you clone it, start it, it automatically starts a Next.js app, a React Native app through Expo, and a, a backend with TRPC. And you can quickly, you can see that you get all of the types in your React Native app inferred straight from your backend. I want to do something more about doing a big push for that, because I really think this sort of doc development will be really beneficial for especially like smaller startups and stuff because it really en it enables people to jump back and forth between the front and the back end a lot easier than however you choose to do things today and um, the fact that you as a front end developer can sort of see what you get back straight away and be able to just like jump over to the back end and change it and get something else 
I think will sort of bridge the gap between those two uh, disciplines that are usually siloed in most companies. And uh, I find that super exciting because I think what most front-end developers will realize is that back-end is a lot easier than they think mm -hmm. in most of the cases. Yeah, lowering that barrier to yeah. entry is a, is a theme we've seen on, on our recent episodes. We recently talked with Michael Jackson of Remix and mm. the, the way they kind of abstract away the API is is very much the same. It, it brings it to the front end developer and it's just like, oh, it's not as hard as I thought. It's just right there. Same, just another function in the file. So I think there's a lot of value in yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I see Remix do a similar thing as Next.js does with the sort of like, inline function um, that you can export. But they also have the post receivers, which is nice. So with the Zart project, have you used that type of architecture before? Have you built any apps where it's a monorepo of React Native and, and React? Yeah, I have, but not with TRPC in production yet. Uh, but I know a bunch of companies that are using that stack with TRPC. And they're using React Native and sort of inferring the backend with the help of TRPC. And I've only gotten positive feedback from them so far. I sort of mentioned this concept earlier, but there's this notion of this architectural notion of backend for the front end, which is like a slim backend system that's that's built dedicated for your product and it it interfaces with other services technologies like trpc enable you to to sort of stitch together that kind of system really trivially where you can have this like sort of facade to your other sort of business domain systems or system whatever it looks like and it, it's easier for your front-end developers product developers to to sort of build like much more rapidly and, and sort of controlling their own API interfaces without having to have this larger API council or whatever. And like every product change is this big, you know, decision of like, oh, well, how do we, you know, how do we shape the API that doesn't break all of our products? If it's like expose a, a, a an easy interface to, to interact with your sort of like product services and then just do it back in for front end and use something like TRPC, then you, you get a lot of the, the sort of rapid approach to, to integrating with these systems without having to worry too much about the, the, the sort of product to back end API. Yeah, and the, and the amount of calls you have to do because the back end is not really made for whatever it can be, like pagination with that little field that you need. Then you can move that to this middle layer. Uh, it's, it's very similar to how... I've ad adopted GraphQL in the past in companies. I don't start by just replacing all the servers. It's what you should start with is like, if you want to use this technology, this, this type of API, you just like put it, put it in between first, and then you can start replacing services underneath without anything breaking for the consumers. And there's a, there's a lot of talk of about like, you know, GraphQL gateways and stuff. I think it's a really good way of doing stuff. And really like, if you're the size of company that needs that uh, sort of like back and forth front end, I would probably advise those to just build a GraphQL uh, server for your domain and use that in all your products over using something like TRPC. Yep. Yep. Always good to know w when you should use what tool or what they're good for. Yeah. I'm trying to not be too bullyish about everyone should use TRPC or whatever. <laughs> the community gets so fragmented when people are just so sensationalist about whatever technology they've created or like. Uh, it's just like there's always trade-offs with everything, right? I mean, TRPC is experimental, not, not experimental in the way that it's unstable, but it's going to change and uh, people might need to rewrite some of their backends when I do a new uh, new major version, whatever. Uh, these things to be aware of when uh, you pick technologies, right? Yep. There's a constant tension between hubris and humility for tool makers. <laughs> so it's like, you know, does my tool solve all the problems or should I just really step back and say it only does, you know, this one thing. What does the future of TRPC look like? So the next thing I'm really excited about doing now is an idea I had last week. Uh, I'm going to start doing a sort of a kitchen sink for TRPC. Uh, sort of think of it as a Tailwind uh, components or a Tailwind UI 
uh, to your PC where I'm just going to do a showcase gallery for a lot of different uh, design patterns uh, and how you use TRPC in different ways with uh, previewing like the front end and the back end and you can just copy copy and paste code over f to to your app. Uh, the things I want to do is sort of like this REST adapter that I talked about uh, earlier. That's definitely something I want to work with. Uh, there is some uh, challenges when you build really, really large APIs with, with TRPC right now that I have to work a bit on. As you get to something like 100 procedures in your backend, it starts getting a bit laggish on the front end because it has to infer the types of all of these, all of your backend. And type inference is amazing. And, you know, inferring types over declaring types is so good for developer experience, but it is uh, slow at a certain scale. Uh, so I need to do some systems for that. Another nut I want to crack is like, I want to be able to find some way of monetizing TRPC <laughs> uh, now that it's getting quite a bit of adoption, because obviously, as any open source maintainer will say, is they spend so much time on it and get no money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm taking time off uh, doing consulting engagements to do TRPC. Consulting pays really well. TRPC pays uh, $200 a month right now. Um, which is, yeah. 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 Probably the, the one way I can think of is just some sort of hosted service. It seems like that's the, the default go-to for most of these things. Yeah. Don't want to do that though. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or it could be oh. consulting with TRPC. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do that. I do that. And that's really fun. I mean, I love those projects where I get to, you know, implement and use TRPC and people, you know, implementing it, see how happy it makes the other developers. Yeah. It's always awesome to see the fruits of your labor. It's really hard to, to monetize open source. There's an interesting and sort of another interesting parallel. What last week or so Rich announced, Rich Harris announced that he'd be joining Oversell. And, and this uh, sort of spawned this whole thread about like the role of open source for companies like Vercel and, and it's, it's poignant to this conversation because like oftentimes the thing that open source is, it's like, yeah, you, you have this tool that's free that people can use, but many times for businesses, it becomes like a marketing thing. It's like, you know, we, we, we give you this tool to say something about our brand and to sort of like build up some perception of like who we are, you know? So like next JS for Vercel is definitely like, it's more of a marketing tool than it is anything else. And, and I, I think there's a thread, there's a nugget of, of wisdom there to sort of pull on. It's maybe like just learning to really lean into that, that like this open source project is sort of a marketing thing, is is a way to figure out monetization from a different angle. So, you know, again, if yeah. it's like consulting, it's like content creation or whatever. It's like, you know, I build this tool to, to generate interest, to, to uh, yeah. serve this market. Anyway. I started TRPC to, you know, scratch my own itch and uh, I had a startup last year and I had my own VC funded startup uh, and I was missing this tooling and I sort of like started doing it on the evenings and weekends, um, but I'm not, I'm not part of that company anymore so I can't use TRPC to promote that or get that company to promote uh, TRPC, but it's interesting the whole hiring of Rich Harris how the reasoning uh, behind that was. I know Svelte is, I mean, Svelte is amazing and I love for that to get more funding and Rich to get more time, but like the business angle of it, I don't fully understand more than marketing. I have many opinions about this and won't spend too much time on it, but I mean, Vercel is a hosting platform. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally yeah. what they are. That's, that's their moneymaker. They are not in the React business. So they support a lot of tools, but those tools make them no money. They are essentially marketing. And and the biggest thing that they want is they want to provide you the tools that give you the easiest inroad into their platform. And right now they've like done a really great job with Next.js in the React ecosystem, but having Rich on board and to make that story easier for Svelte means that two of the three big players or maybe two of the four big players if you count angular are sort of in this 
in this space now. And if they can provide that sort of first class story, then, you know, they start becoming the de facto of like the platform that you go to, to host your, your stuff. And, and I think that's the big, that's the, their big play. Yeah. What do you think about the future of, you know, Re React versus Svelte versus et cetera? This plays into a good question that we were going to ask you. So I'll turn this around on you in a second. I, I think, I think Svelte's a great technology. It, it, it was like, a very clever innovation from Rich. And I think it will continue to grow and evolve in ways that like other platforms will struggle. React is very complex, but it, it does what it does very, very well. And the team behind it is just, they're so incredibly brilliant. So as server components come out and like these more sort of robust interfaces come out for doing things like better server-side rendering, which React struggled with for a long time, you know, I think that will just help the ecosystem. I don't, I mean, I, I just see all the things continuing to grow uh, unless something major changes, like Facebook gets broken up or, or their team or the React team sort of gets gutted in some way. That would be pretty devastating because React itself is, is an incredibly complex technology, whereas I think Svelte is, is more like, approachable in a way, if you're wanting to contribute to one or the other, um, this is no, you know, again, nothing against react. I, I think that like that team is amazing and they have done their best to make it easy to contribute. And a lot of people do contribute to it, but you know, trade-offs, but to turn this around on you. So what do you think the future of the web looks like and what are you most excited about? The future of the web. I mean, I feel, I mean, I definitely, I'm very biased on this, but I definitely feel like we're moving, the shift is going back to monoliths in general. Like we've had these broken up microservices as a trend the last 10 years. And I mean, I don't think that's a revolutionary opinion, but we are definitely moving back to these sort of integrated developer experiences. And that excites me because it gives you a big productivity boost. And you'd have to spend less time on infra and uh, stitching services and whatnot. But in terms of web development, what is the next big thing? I think I really believe in Svelte as a technology. Like everything I've seen about it just feels like it just makes sense. And uh, if one of the things that is really hard with React is like, it's hard to do React well. There's a hundred million ways of doing React wrong and there's a few ways to do it right and they're hard to get right and Svelte seems to have found like a really good way of writing really performant web applications in a way that is very approachable and easy and you you have less chance of fucking up your code so I'm really excited about that yeah I, I love react too but algebraic effects have have sent my mind in a flurry a few times <laughs> <laughs> yeah man it's it's just hard and it is sort of like the this sort of like array with dependencies just you have to have and then sometimes you have to memorize like complex objects and like yeah and then pro prop drilling is also hard you know and then if you don't want to do prop drilling you have to do like this context provider and then that's hard there's just so many things that are by design difficult in a react to get right that to say like i love react i've used it for seven years and but I still struggle with it. And I feel like yeah. after seven years with the technology, I shouldn't struggle it, with it. It should be like air or like... One like baseline thing that I would say is when I think about the future of the web, I think compilers are the future of the web and Svelte is a part of that story. You might even say DSLs, domain-specific languages, potentially, but, but definitely compilers being a central story in the web. You know, WebAssembly is a thing that's that's growing larger and larger. But pretty much all the tooling that we have now is enhanced by better and better compilers. And now we're moving out of JavaScript to get even yeah. better sort of performance for our compilers. So, you know, there's Lee from the next JS team, like put out an article about Rust as the future of like web tooling or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, so I, I think this is all just a testament that we're doing more and more complex compilation to sort of use the web as a target less so than like, we have to do all these weird things to like, you know, I guess hit the platform. Yeah. It's like, we can use it as a compilation target. 
And I think uh, compilers are really interesting. Like I've been really careful with TRPC not to do any sort of uh, compiler of it, but I might end up there eventually. And uh, I'm super excited about Wasm. I can't wait for the day where you know everything is in place in Rust or whatever other languages uh, language there is that gives me this like full experience that TypeScript does. Like I I love TypeScript and I will stick to that until I have something that can replace all of TypeScript, not just this compiles to an okay front end uh, library or a hard really hard to write back end. Um, but I like to have like the same language everywhere until there's a really, really good reason not to. Yeah, always bet on TypeScript. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done a big bet on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, with that, I think it's a good time to transition into tooltips. So my first tooltip isn't really a tooltip. It's just uh, <laughs> talking about new features in TypeScript that I think are a long time coming and really, really nice. So first up is the awaited type. I've wanted to do this so much, so many times. I've turned to type fest and like copy and pasting answers from Stack Overflow. Finally, there's a new type in TypeScript called awaited, which unwraps promises, even deeply nested promises, which that's pretty cool. So you can actually get the, the value that the promise will return. This makes it a lot easier to extract values from, from functions. Like recently, I just had a function that I returned to some JSON object and it was in a promise. And this type of type makes it really easy to extract that object interface from the return type. So super excited to see that. Another cool one, which uh, a lot of people have complained about is when you upgrade TypeScript, you also bring along all of the library upgrades and that has the potential to break your builds. So going from a minor version to a minor version of TypeScript can often result in a lot of things breaking because those underlying libraries have changed. Now those libraries are published to NPM and you can depend directly on them. So even though you're upgrading your version of TypeScript, your DOM types don't have to upgrade. So that's, I think that's going to be a huge boon to productivity. And then there's a bunch of other cool stuff. One I'm excited about is top level await because every time I write scripts, I always have to create a main function in my JavaScript. Yeah. No more. Now you can just await away. A few releases back, they added type imports, but the kind of shitty thing about them was that you had to create a second import statement where it was only type imports. Now you can just put that straight in the import statement and it, it works. So that'll clean up a bunch of code because I don't like seeing multiple lines importing from the same module. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. But ES modules was planned to be in this release, but they pushed it for 4.6, which I'm sad about because it's, I hope, I think it's blocking as me re releasing view support for TRPC. Uh -huh. Yeah, ES modules is a slow-moving beast. <laughs> yeah, I spent a day battling with interoperability between CommonJS and, and ES modules a few weeks ago. Just sort of up. our parallel to the from the, like Python two to Python three thing that was like such yeah. a terrible thing in that ecosystem. For us, it's like ES modules. <laughs> yeah, CommonJS. There's some some things you can't even use nowadays, like. Uh, yeah. Note fetch. Yeah, it's it sucks when you're upgrading a dependency and then it's like, oop, they decided ESM was now, and now I have to add all this tooling and configuration just to deal with this one dependency or just stay on the old version. Yep. <laughs> yep. So my first tool tip of the day is a tool called TL Draw. So this tool is from Steve Ruiz. So I've been following Steve on Twitter for a while. His Twitter feed is just at absolute delight because he, he shows these really short gifs of him messing with like UX experiences, like tiny UX experiences, like, Oh, what is it like to resize these grouped things? Or like, how do these things supposed to behave when you move them around or whatever? It's such a joy to see him iterate on this. And, and so he's finally sort of released it. It's open source. There's a VS code extension that you can use to have teal draw like right in your browser. So you can, you can think of uh, teal draw kind of at like, oh boy, why did I just go blank? What is the other? Excaladraw. <laughs> Excaladraw, there you go. 
you can think of teal draw like Excaladrol. It, it fills a very similar niche. It's like a very simplistic app just to sort of sketch some stuff in. Works great on mobile, mobile web. Like, so, you know, that's that's nice. I've got multiplayer. It's, it's a really delightful experience. And again, if you go through his Twitter feed and look at all the, just all the little iterations that he's done on just getting things to feel good, I mean, so much great work. Steve is just excellent. This library is excellent. Definitely play with it. And if you really, really like it, you should definitely support him. Again, same sort of thing. It's like we have a lot of people working on this really excellent free tooling. You like it, support it. Same with TRPC. You like it, please support it. <laughs> I didn't know what to put, but I'm sure this has been up on the podcast like a couple of times already. Prisma really love it like especially if you work with, with like trpc or graphql or whatever type safe stuff prisma is an orm for mysql and postgres and i think they have mongodb support now but it's not really a conventional orm because every query you write you get back a pure object that you can't perform any operations uh, on so it's actually a query builder but they call it orm because it's easier and they have a lot of good tooling for just like building your data modeling and automatically generate an sdk for your database that's really uh, good to use and with with trpc then uh, you just return that object that query and you can use it straight in your front end if you change your database migrations, you get type errors straight away on your front end all the way through. So it's a really nice experience to work with Prisma. Yeah, my favorite thing about it is the hassle-free migrations because we currently yeah. don't have that in our code base. And I literally have to write an up and a down for, for migrating. And sometimes writing the down is pre pretty intense and I am not the, the most versed in SQL. <laughs> You can just skip that as well. Yeah, I wrote a really complex Postgres migration the other day. And like, yeah, you sort of, the the great thing about Prisma is like, you kind of forget how to write the SQL because it just, <laughs> you, you barely ever have to, you know, jump out of what they give you from default, which I've never felt with another ORM. Yeah, the best tools you don't notice. Yeah, another big shout out to the Prisma team. They have really, really good, like a really, really good language server for their, so they have their own schema language sort of, where you sort of describe the relationships of things. But so if you're like start a relationship, if you're like, hey, you know, this this type has, you know, many of this other type or whatever, if you're describing like a one-to-many or many-to-many -many relationship, it'll like automatically fill out everything and all the places that you need. It's It's magical. It's so good really love it yeah the editor experience is sick i love it and yeah it's just it just works right i've had very little issues with it my last tool tip for the day is next auth auth is a lot of the times a pain and a hassle to set up but i've turned to this library countless times to add authentication to my Next.js applications and it's just so easy like right now i'm building an app called pitchforkify which takes all the Pitchfork album reviews and then connects it to Spotify so it's easy to listen through them. And they had a Spotify provider and I got my auth up and running in like 10 minutes compared to fiddling with it for hours and hours. So if you need an authentication solution, I'd highly suggest uh, Next.js auth if you have a Next.js application. Another guy that got hired by Vercel, by the way. Yep. Oh, interesting, interesting. That makes sense though, that's a... That's a yeah. clever one. Yeah, the easiest path, path to open source monetization, just get hired by Vercel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, so uh, I, I do wonder, and, and, and I almost hope that more companies in the Yoki system kind of follow suit because one of the best ways to fund people who do open source is to hire them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually give yeah. them a job, you know? So. You know, so long as that can become a non-exploitive relationship and they can kind of continue to do their thing, you know, I'd love to see more of that. Yeah. B better than just like donating like $10,000 randomly. Because at the end I, of the I day, it's like, oh, $10,000. That's so great. But it's not <laughs> much, you know, when you're like, I have to live, <laughs> pay rent, you know. I mean, yeah, I if it's monthly, that's good. Yeah, if it's monthly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some people making proper bank on open source, right? Mm -hmm. It is possible. 
Yeah, but the the amount of people is very small. Yeah. You know, it's you know like, all of them by name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, 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 somebody like Evan Yu who can like you know sustainably live on it, whereas like you know most people can't. They don't. They make pocket change. Yeah. yeah, we can't all be Cinder. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I would want to either because like I like build tools to because I scratch an itch mm-hmm. itch of something I want to use. So yeah. then I don't get to use the tool either. Yeah. yeah all, all sort of depends, I guess. Okay. My last tool tip of the day is this library that I ran across called CoShare. So CoShare is essentially an application that makes it really, really easy to do real-time synchronization of a client. This is a hard problem. There's been a lot of libraries that have like come out over the years to solve this and you know, way back in the day, there was like ShareJS. I don't know if any of y'all ever used that, but you know, there's been like a lot of research on CRDTs and, and you know, all these mechanisms to like make this kind of thing happen. It's really, really hard. This a kosher library is nice because it gives like a, a relatively easy interface to just like kind of slap this in front of your already pre-existing app and make it work. You know, again, all of these things, anytime you have a real-time system like this, there are always trade-offs that you will hit uh, and unique constraints to that system setup. So this is not going to solve everything. They have some different implementations of networking interfaces. So like, for example, they have a socket IO interface, which a lot of people who are making like multiplayer games in the node ecosystem will use like socket IO. So, you know, there's complexities to it still but it, it it's just a nice uh a nice way to to bring multiplayer to your app bring real-time collaboration so that's the thing that interests you definitely check it out this package they link to simple peer seems pretty interesting too easy peer-to-peer it's very cool i want to check out all of these cool more tool tips alex i mean trpc <laughs> Maybe, maybe I don't know if I mentioned it before on the podcast, but <laughs> maybe check that out. Okay. Well, that's it for this week's episode of DevTools FM. Thanks a lot, Alex, for coming on. This We tend to talk about front-end things. It was nice to talk about back-end things for a change. Thank you. It was really fun being on. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. If anyone wants to, like, yeah, shout out to anyone that wants to talk about TRPC, I love hopping on a call to just... Twitter DMs or Twitter public, whatever. Hate it, love it. That's me. <laughs> the online nature of everything. Well, that's it for this week's episode of DevTools FM. Be sure to follow us on YouTube and wherever you consume your podcasts. Thanks for listening.